Okay. Sarah, can you see your slides? Why I only see myself, I guess, is that the way it is set up? Um, well, here we are. Uh, you might be able to change your view to see oh. more speaker windows. Okay. We have one camera on in the room right now, so you can see a fraction of our audience. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess we only have right. I forgot. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot you guys. And I, I'm so used to seeing all the faces on Zoom, right? Because everybody logged on to Zoom. We're about 25 okay. Minutes. There are about 25 students in, in at the hotel, in the room, in person, and there's okay. several more online. Do you, I hear echo. Um, do you, uh, we're going to hear echo once you begin speaking. Everyone on Zoom, uh, everyone else on Zoom should have their microphones muted, please. Um, yeah, and I'll open the floor to both in person and Zoom. Oops. Well, let's just, uh, yeah, it's four, it's just after four, it's just after four here in New Mexico. Four, it's just after four here in New Mexico. Four. That wasn't supposed to happen. Four. I thought we fixed that. Was it a question of meaning about Okay. Okay, that's fine. Oh, yeah. I think I know what's going so on. when when I speak, um, do you hear okay, okay. when I talk? We're, we're fixing our own problems. <laughs> okay. okay. But you hear me okay, right? I hear you okay. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Could someone on Zoom confirm they can't hear me? <laughs> um the people who are on Zoom, can you hear me okay? Yes. Can they not hear me? Okay, very good. Hang on, is that you muted? Is that no, you're not muted. Mayan, can you hear me? This is Chris. Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, good. Uh yeah, let me quickly uh introduce you. Uh so our next speaker is uh Dr. Uh, Hayan Gao from affiliated with Duke uh, University of Brookhaven National Lab. She is the Associate uh, Laboratory Director for Nuclear and Particle Physics at BNL. Um, she was previously the uh, chair, I guess she was Tom's chair, right? She was the uh, chair of the, Tom Meehan is here. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Hi, Tom. And participant. Uh, uh, she was previously chair of the physics department at Duke. Um, she's a leader in the experimental nuclear physics enterprise in the US, including uh, uh, the upcoming EIC where uh, PMD physics will be probed meticulously. And um, this is our one uh, experimental lecture series uh, to give some real meat to uh, the physics we're talking about. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Gao uh, tell us in uh, lecture today and tomorrow about uh, semi-inclusive BIS experiments and more and what we can learn about PMDs from them. So please go ahead, Ayant. Yeah, thank you very much for the um, introduction. And um, when I was invited, I don't remember now, must be two years ago when um, when I first invited, was invited to um, deliver lectures at the summer school. Um, and um, obviously, you know, life has changed in a major way because of COVID and also because my uh, current uh, arrangement um, at BNL. So um, I apologize if I sounded if I sound a little bit incoherent. <laughs> and there are also destruction. We may have someone, you know, who may be COVID positive, you know, in the house. So anyway, so um, so what I would like to do is just to give you a flavor about um, some of the uh, um, experimental activities uh, related to um, TND. And, um, you know, the original title um, was very broad. And um, so, you know, in the end, I, I always felt it is important to try to focus on something, you know, instead of trying to cover everything. So, the focus of these two lectures are really um, what I wanted to do is to introduce you to um, um, you know, ex on the experimental 
aspects are related to uh, spin physics and TMD uh, in particular. And um, zoom in on semi inclusive deep elastic scaling measurement and tell you um, what kind of experiment people have done and what kind of experiment um, are um, ongoing and also on uh, future. Um, in terms of Jefferson Lab 12 GE and um, EIC. And um, you probably already talked a lot about um, you know, the kind of motivation. So some of the slides I always like to uh, show just to remind us you know, why we even care, right? And we really care because um, we wanted to understand um, you know, basically the matter in the uh, universe. And in our case, Really, we are talking about visible matter, right? And atomic nuclei. And, um, and um, you know, nucleons are the building blocks of atomic nuclei. And um, the focus is really trying to understand uh, the nucleon uh, structure. And um, in this case, we are you know, using the kind of very um, effective probe in order to look at internal structure. And um, you have already learned a lot or you heard a lot about QCD and I am not going to uh, repeat other than um, you know letting you know which you know already you know the kind of region uh, we are particularly interested which is also very difficult is the so-called non perturbative uh, region right you cannot really apply PQCD calculation and um, you know in order to understand QCD um, Ideally, what we really want, which we hope uh, is the future of EIC, we will be able to make major progress, is really try to understand the structure not only about nuclei, but also about atomic uh, nuclei from the first principles of the theory, QCD, in terms of quark gluons. But you know, we have to start somewhere, which is our uh, nuclear uh, structure. And um, so that is what you know, we are here about, and TMD's three-dimensional structure is a very important part. But when we talk about nuclear structure, it's actually very broad, right? We can talk about, you know, we can talk about elastic scattering, try to understand um, nuclear structure in terms of charge and the current distribution. And we also, you know, can think about the momentum and flavor distribution. And we can also talk about um, the kind of uh, so-called polarizability, which is really when we apply external electromagnetic field, how a composite sub object like proton and nuclear will respond to external electric and electro electric and magnetic field and the, 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 the structure related um, you know, uh, constant is called polarizability, um, corresponding to electric and magnetic. And uh, we are here to really um, you know, try to understand the three dimensional uh, structure. And the way to, um, one in very important way is to do lepton scattering. So, you know, I like to think about this as a microscope, right? You know, biologists uh, use their microscope to look at biological system. And, um, you know, as um, high energy uh, nuclear experimentalist uh, working with uh, lepton beams, and essentially we also have a, um, 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 we also have a uh, microscope. So in this case, it is a very powerful one, which means that um, you know, we are looking at smaller uh, distance compared with what biologists use. So just to set um, the kind of scale, so if we are looking at, um, I have to take one step back. Um, so here, um, um, so just, just give me, just give me one second. Um, do you hear some noise in the background? So. Okay, so if okay, um, so when we talk about lepton scattering, um, um, it is um, very clean probe of hadronic structure. When I say clean, it is compared with I can also use proton beam, right? I can use pion beam, right? So those are the hadronic system, and in this case, my probe is um, a point like particle, electron, or muon. So um, the interaction is you know QED and electromagnetic, so therefore um, it is QED um, in terms of my probe. And um, so, you know, we actually, in principle, we understand everything about QED, but, but in practice, of course, you know, you have, you know, um, there, um, 
if you want to include all the higher orders, which of course is, but, but the good news is the coupling, you know, um, is one over um, 137, right? So here, higher order effect or exchange um, is um, suppressed so that um, one photon exchange is uh, dominant. And um, so this actually means that, you know, to first order, you worry about um, one photon exchange uh, contribution. But of course, we also have learned over the years that two photon exchange um, effect is, you know, can be quite uh, important as well. So let's just focus on one photon exchange. And then the uh, interaction is, you know, the, uh, the, the false mediator is a virtual photon in this case. So you can see that if I, you know, the virtual photon energy or momentum as you go up and correspondingly the probe size uh, becomes smaller and smaller, right? So um, a typical, the nucleon is about one Fermi and nucleus is several Fermi to 10 Fermi. So if I have a probe, which is less than the size of the nucleon and now I'm looking inside uh, the nucleon in terms of atomic uh, structure. And um, so, one can look at this kind of picture, right? If I do, uh, let's just use electron, okay? Um, as an example, I can do electron proton scattering and the horizontal axis here um, is this quantity called energy transfer. And another way is to think about this is the energy uh, carried by the virtual photon. So you can, you know, the first thing you will see if you do an experiment, um, you have a target, which is proton or liquid hydrogen. And then you have an electron beam coming in, and then you have a um, detector. You know, you can put your detector corresponding to a fixed scattering angle um, in the laboratory. So the first thing you will detect is, um, you know, the scattered electron corresponding to elastic scattering it means that, um, you know, initial state you have a, a electron and you have a target proton, and final state you have a scattered electron and you have a recall proton. But if you give a little bit more energy transfer, right, and then you can excite the proton into its excited state of delta, which is the first excited state, and, and higher energy, uh, more energy transfer, you go to the higher nucleon excited state. If you give even more energy, uh, as we talk about, you know, the probe size is now much smaller than the nucleon size. So now you actually look deep inside um, the, the nucleon, and this is so called deep in, inelastic scattering. So in this case, the virtual photon is now coupled to the uh, platonic uh, point-like particle inside, and which is, um, you know, a quark, right? So if I do um, a nuclear target carbon or some other nuclear target, and then, you know, in principle, the kind of overall structure looks very similar, of course, when you have a nuclear uh, nucleus. So it is much more uh, complicated because you can excite nuclear to the uh, um, um, its excited state, and you can also have um you can excite the nu nuclear in some kind of coherent way. So you have you can have a, you know for example joint a dipole resonance, and you can have some other excited state. And then you can when when you give a little bit more energy, and then this virtual photon now can couple. Uh, to a nucleon inside a nucleus. And this is corresponding so-called quasi-elastic uh, uh, peak. And, um, and then, you know, you can excite the nucleon uh, inside nucleus to delta and then um, and star resonance. And then eventually you also go into the deep elastic. And because of the Fermi motion, you know, of the nucleon inside the nucleus, so that uh, when you see the quasi-elastic peak compared with elastic from proton, you know, it's broadened due to the kind of Fermi uh, motion. And, and of course, one very important aspect is, you know, about the platonic structure, this uh, structure or distribution, like momentum, for example, of flavor distribution inside the proton, whether that's the same as inside the nucleus, just by scaling, you know, by the number of nucleons, for example. And a very interesting effect called EMC, which is not, it's different after you do the scaling. And this is one of the very interesting effects um, uh, physicists have learned. And until today, I still, um, I think that we still don't know exactly, I mean, the origin for EMC. In fact, we have a lot of ideas, but I don't think we have a clear uh, 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 consensus on what is the origin. And um, so in the question about, you know, neutron and proton um, structure, and this is the slide I borrowed years ago from Jian Wei. 
it, it actually is longstanding, right? Because, um, you know, over the years, um, if you look back, actually, uh, 1933, uh, the proton anomalous magnetic moment already tells us that proton um, is not a point-like particle. It has um, internal structure. And um, as you all know, uh, about a year ago, or a little bit less than a year ago, the muon G minus two experiment um, uh, result released by Fermilab, um, which um, you know um, shows very interesting um, tantalizing um, evidence of all new physics. And um, if you know if the particle is point-like, like the electron muon, you expect for C one half particle G equal two. And um, so elastic scattering, as I mentioned, um, you know, started uh, in the, actually even before 1960 in the 50s, and um, that's how people measure the charge uh, and the current distribution. And Nobel Prize was given in 1960 uh, for that um, uh, finding or discovery. And deep elastic scattering uh, is the kind of experiment we just introduced, and that's how the platonic uh, structure uh, particle model uh, came about. And um, so what we are interested um, is um, deep elastic scattering. Uh, when we're thinking about um, you know, TND physics, uh, we are really looking at um, you know, the kind of particle distribution inside the nucleon. So therefore, the, uh, for experiment, we want to design the kind of experiment, making sure that we are beyond all the nucleon uh, resonance regions. So we are in the deep elastic uh, scattering region so that the corresponding probe size is much smaller than the, uh, um, than the uh, uh, nucleon size. And the invariant mass of the system is beyond you know, the kind of known nucleon resonance uh, we, we, we know. And um, so a few quantities very quickly. One um, we talk about, which is the energy transfer, which is um, the uh, um, whatever the energy carried by the virtual photon, uh, which is the energy difference between the incident electron and the scattered um, uh, scattering electron. And uh, Q squared is if, if I use the uh, uh, full momentum of the virtual photon as Q, and which is just the uh, full momentum difference of the uh, incident and um, scattering electron full momentum. And the um, Q square, uh, we typically like to use the, in the negative of the uh, full momentum transfer square, which um, we call uh, just call Q square. Um, that is um, a positive number when we do um, electron scattering. And so Q squared in some way also tells you how deep you really are probing your system, okay? And, um, and, and um, the other quantity which is very uh, uh, useful is called Bjorgin X, which is Q squared um, divided by 2M is the mass of the target if you do EP um, uh, scattering. So it's proton mass and mu is the energy transfer, okay? And um, so, Right, so, so in the, in the um, particle model or in the infinite um, momentum frame and beyond in variable x, um, which is you know, from zero to one, and that corresponding to the uh, longitudinal momentum fraction of the particle of the, um, of the um, nucleon. The fraction, right. So, um, and one important um, aspect is, you know, um, so-called uh, pattern distribution, universal pattern distribution. So one can do deep elastic scattering and one can also do a uh, Dreyang experiment. So remember early I talked about um, the advantage of um, electron scattering because the probe is uh, simpler, right, clean. But on the other hand, you know, Dreyang experiment it is actually very attractive in the sense that I can have a pion beam on a proton, um, I can have a proton on proton. So in this case, the kind of diagram um, you are looking at and the final state you detect a, a lepton pair and mu plus mu minus pair, for example. And in this case, you know, <clears throat> the process you're looking at at the platonic level is quark and anti quark annihilate. And then the final state is a lepton pair. And the advantage is, you know, that's a very nice probe of anti quark distribution uh, inside the uh, hadron, or in this case, for, if I use a 
proton, um, you know, as um, my target and all hiding B, and I am looking at um, the anti quark distribution in the proton. So, um, so to show you um, these two graphs, um, the purpose is really to show that um, you know people have looked at um, these uh, structure functions from um, and the on cross section. Um, you know, um, over function of you know several order of magnitude uh, for Q square, for example, here, and the cross section or the uh, structure function also uh, cross section over orders of magnitude and can be described very well by uh, next leading order um, QCD calculation, which means the kind of you know study we're trying to do um, uh, all um, through deep elastic or JM, um, you know, has the universe. So uh, property, um, and, and similarly, when we think about TMD physics, right, in the end, we wanted to look at TMD uh, physics from different processes, making sure that um, we can describe them, you know, in a, 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 in a um, uh, um, co consistent uh, framework, so that really try to understand this kind of three-dimensional um, uh, imaging. So I want to say a little bit about spin. Um, so spin is uh, important um, uh, quantum property of particles and throughout um, history of physics, it um, you know, really uh, uh, led to uh, um, some major uh, discoveries um, in, in physics, um, but also actually has a major, um, has made a major impact um, in terms of applications. So just some example like nuclear magnetic resonance resonances and um, and um, uh, magnetic resonance imaging um, and uh, you know more recently we're talking about quantum computing and um, so it really has extremely uh, important uh, uh, um, importance um, in in fundamental uh, science um, but also in um, applications. But um, so one very important thing is about the proton spin, right? And proton um, is being uh, one half uh, object. And um, as we, you know, as I introduced to you about um, electron scattering from proton, and for a long time, you know, people do um, unpolarized uh, scattering. So use unpolarized electron beam. Electron, by the way, is being one half, you know. And um, unparalyzed target to do scaling. But you know, later people also wanted to know um, you know, the proton spin contribution, but the naive, naive picture is they must you know, have come from the uh, quark spin, which is spin one half. So physicists started to do uh, so-called polarized uh, deep in inelastic scaling experiments. So in this case, you use a polarized lepton beam, for example, electron beam. And you also have a polarized target, and um, then you do a uh, deep elastic scattering, making sure you are in deep in, in elastic scattering uh, region. Then you look on uh, spin dependence, try to um, you know disentangle uh, the spin dependent uh, structural functions. So if it's unpolarized one, you know you have two uh, uh, structural function f1, f2, and then if um, um, if you do polarized measurement with, uh, I'm talking about spin one half target, and you have um, additional uh, G1, G2 spin structure function for inclusive um, deep elastic uh, scattering. Um, I want to take, um, I, I, mean, I, I should modify my title a little bit uh, in the interest of time and also for TMD physics, we're really focusing on, I, 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 I should, you know, um, um, I removed some slides, and but now I just realized I'm not consistent with myself because later on I will also show you some results um, from single spin asymmetry, but a single beam spin asymmetry. So, but anyway, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about how um, physicists or um, nuclear uh, physicists um, polarize um, uh, proton and um, and uh, neutron. But in the case of neutron, we have to use. Um, uh, uh, effective uh, neutron target um, to give you some idea. Okay, so here actually this is a slide. So um, 
you know, when we think about if I want to do polarized uh, proton experiment, so I have, you know, hydrogen and I just wanted to polarize uh, hydrogen or proton. But when, when it comes to neutron, right, and neutron is just as important as proton when we think about um, QCD, when we think about atomic um, nuclei, because they are, you know, both nucleons, right, and they are the building blocks of uh, nuclei. But, but if I want to do scattering experiment on neutron and polarized neutron, that's very difficult, right? Because neutron um, decays and um, you know, I just cannot figure out how I can do an experiment um, in you know, neutron lifetime, which is you know, less than on the order of 15 minutes, right? Unless I have a polarized neutron beam and um, then I can you know, do experiment, um, but to my knowledge, um, um, I, I, I don't think that's true. Okay, so, so then, you know, the idea is in the case of neutron, we can think about this on um, the nuclear uh, system. And the most simple one is deuteron, right? Which has one proton and one neutron. And deuteron is spin one. Uh, uh, so if it's a vector polarized uh, deuteron, because when, when the spin is one, in addition to vector polarization, which means you can think about spin or magnetic moment being aligned, but um, it can have so-called tensor pol polarization in the case of deuteron, but let's not worry about that. Let's just think about um, you know, vector polarization. And to first order, you know, you basically, if you have a, a polarized deuteron, you can think about, you know, neutron and proton are polarized. So if I know everything about uh, proton, so I do experiment on the deuteron, I can remove uh, the proton part of the contribution that gave me information on the neutron. Or I, if I have a way to tag, um, you know, the, uh, on the, the, I can tag the, you know, the recall proton, then I know uh, my process happened on the neutron. But the other way is to use a polarized helium-3, and helium-3 is also a spin one-half uh, particle. And the nice thing about helium-3 is that, um, you know, about 88% of the time, um, the two proton spin are um, anti-parallel to each other. And so that helium-3 spin is essentially carried by the unpaired uh, neutron. You only have one neutron in this case. So, um, so, so this is actually, uh, when you think about spin-dependent measurement, um, polarized helium-3 uh, has, you know, certainly has its advantage, but the disadvantage is, you know, helium-3 nucleus is um, uh, a little bit more complicated than the deuteron. Um, so for future EIC, um, there is also plan to have a polarized helium-3 uh, ion uh, um, in, in the uh, collider to collide with polarized electron. And um, of course, EIC will do uh, polarized electron on polarized proton, right? Okay, so, um, right, and, and um, neutron decay, so the lifetime is um, about 15 minutes. Um, so how do we actually polarize um, proton, for example? And, um, well, you can do brute force method, right? It's, uh, it has a magnetic moment. And um, if I apply a strong magnetic field and go to low temperature, and then um, just from Boltzmann distribution, um, you know, eventually the system will reach uh, some kind of stable uh, or equilibrium polarization. But of course, if you look at the proton and the electron, and because of the mass difference, right? So the electron magnetic moment is so much uh, uh, larger than the uh, proton. So that if you use this kind of brute force method to polarize um, electron and the proton, and, and you can see that, you know, um, for the electron, you can reach the uh, maximum polarization, um, you know, with uh, still low temperature, but not, you know, compared with proton, it actually takes, in order to reach a high polarization, it takes extremely low temperature, right? So in this case, it's um, one, you know, um, a minute Kelvin. And, um, and, and, and the other very important, um, quantity is so-called um, uh, time constant, uh, T1, and which is, um, which is, you can also think about this as the, um, 
the, the time it takes for the system to reach the kind of thermal equilibrium and when you reach the uh, saturation polarization. But it is also the kind of time constant for depolarization. Um, so this is called um, spin lattice uh, relaxation. So here I just show you how long it takes. Okay, so this is obviously um, a very difficult way to polarize photon. So what people have done is to use the method called uh, dynamic uh, nuclear polarization. So the method is that um, you actually to introduce some um, impurity or paramagnetic impurity uh, into the system. And then you can pull it, which means you have, in this case, you have some unpaired electrons, and then um, you can use the brute force method to polarize um, electron. As we um, talk about, it's uh, a lot easier to polarize electron. And then one can drive, um, I uh, sorry, one can use a uh, um, a microwave um, to um, uh, transfer polarization from the uh, um, from the um, electron to the uh, uh, proton, and the interaction is just dipole dipole interaction. Essentially, you know that's how it works. And um, so this is the kind of method um, you know one can uh, uh, reach uh, a very decent polarization. For um, dynamic nuclear polarization, you can reach uh, something 80 um, plus for proton and 70 plus for, for neutron. And the idea is very, very simple. And if you are interested, you know, um, there are review articles you can read and also you can look at um, the lecture from uh, Christoph Keys. Um, um, a few years ago, he gave a nice a lecture and I took the slide uh, from his um, lecture. Okay, so um, Compass um, uh, experiment. Um, Compass is one of the first two um, experimental programs or, or collaboration uh, who actually uh, carried out uh, some inclusive uh, deep elastic scaling to Extract it um, for uh, compass is based on dynamic uh, polarized uh, uh, nuclear dynamic polarization method, and um, they did experiment uh, with polarized proton and also neutron, and currently they are uh, getting ready to uh, do their polarized uh, neutron measurement for transversely polarized neutron and for TND, which I will talk later. And at Jefferson Lab, um, the uh, um, um, dynamic nuclear polarization technique also has been used for uh, Hall B and also Hall C. And um, again, for both proton and the deuteron. And so far, the target has been used for uh, not for transverse polarization, but for uh, longitudinal uh, polarization. And so that is um, one way. Um, um, but this is low temperature, um, uh, strong magnetic field, and, um, and one uh, important uh, limitation of this kind of target is that um, it cannot take a uh, high uh, beam in intensity. And um, so, and, and also um, there is important uh, dilution factor one need to worry about. Um, so the other way to polarize is to use atomic uh, beam source method for uh, that also works for both hydrogen and deuterium. And, and I will mention this, that Hermes experiment, which is one of the first two uh, some inclusive DRS experiment for uh, TNB physics, um, Hermes target. Um, Hermes started with polarized helium-3 target and later moved on to um, atomic beam source method. And um, so the technique is actually not too difficult. If you think about a hydrogen, well, first of all, uh, normally hydrogen and deuterium come as molecular form. So you have to uh, use a dissociator, which is an IF dissociator to dissociate molecules into atom, atomic form. Okay, and, you, and, and this is uh, a very well established uh, technique. So now you look at the hydrogen, um, you know, here is hydrogen and this is um, deuteron. 
So you can look at the, uh, um, you think about hydrogen in terms of um, both the electron and the proton, right? And um, the uh, energy uh, level. And you think about them together. So you have an electron and you have a nu nu nucleus, which is proton. Here is neutron. And if you think about these four energy states, if you label them as one, two, three, four, right? So, um, and this is how it works. And you let the atomic beam to go through um, a, a, a six, six to four magnets. And so because of the magnetic uh, uh, gradient, so that you, you design everything so that um, what happened is that, um, you know, after the, the atomic beam pass through the uh, septuple and basically half of the state actually are uh, filtered out or does not make through, you have a slit uh, going through the whole system. And then you can drive, um, I, uh, uh, um, you can drive a uh, transition to um, basically um, to manipulate um, the uh, uh, distribution of the uh, um, particle of uh, uh, hydrogen atom. Um, and then you, you, know, you, you go through, then you apply the procedure again, you go through another sex pole, again, you filter through half of the atomic, uh, electron atomic state so that you can get um, the polarized um, uh, uh, nucleus or uh, proton. And if you, do another um, I transition, you can also flip on um, um, the proton can be polarized in the opposite way. And you do the same trick, or you can do the same thing for a DuPont. And so that is the kind of method uh, people use, also called atomic uh, beam source. And it's pure, right? And the nice thing is it's pure. And, um, but of course, you know, it's a flux. It's, uh, uh, it's basically, it's a, uh, um, gas and so obviously the density is low and but this actually worked for um, uh, internal uh, storage rain where the uh, the uh, beam intensity is high but it's a uh, um, storage uh, rain type of experiment like Hermes uh, for example this is the uh, Hermes uh, experiment you can see the Hera beam polytron or electron beam goes through this way and this is the uh, atomic beam source, which you have a discharge, and then you have a different sextuple, and you have a different uh, uh, IF transition uh, region. And, um, and interestingly, when you want to measure the polarization and the perimeter uh, method is, uh, is very, very similar, like the way you polarize. Essentially, you want to manipulate um, if you think, I don't know how N1, N2, N3, N4 is uh, distributed. All I need to do is just manip manipulate. So I can play a uh, different kind of trick to change how they are from different states, analyze to measure how I want to write down all equations, then I can determine uh, in the end, I saw the for equation by my measurement, and then I can, um, and I always have a normalization, which is one. And that's how you can measure the polarization. And this um, Hermes experiment, you know, has used this type of technique very, very successfully. And another technique, which is also uh, interesting, is called uh, laser-driven um, hydrogen at train uh, target. And um, in this case, um, you know, um, what this is actually, by the way, um, was um, the target uh, when I was at MIT, we built. And of course, it was pioneered at Argonne uh, National Lab by Roy Holt and his group um, early on. So you also need to um, discharge the molecules into atom and like ABS, okay? And then you actually, in the system, you also introduce um, some alkali uh, atom. In this case, we used potassium, which has um, one unpaired electron. And then you can do a uh, laser um, optical pumping to polarize um, the uh, potassium atom. And then potassium atom and the um, uh, hydrogen um, proton, um, you can have a spin exchange. And that's how actually electronic spin transfer to the nucleus uh, proton spin. And, and, and this is the kind of um, uh, technique um, people um, 
we 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 actually built and 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 unfortunately um the only experiment we actually did um with laser driven target was an experiment years ago at Indiana University Cyclotron, where Indiana used to have a polarized proton, and we did a polarized proton on polarized neutron to look for three body force. And um, later we built a target for MIT based experiment, but in the end, um, we actually, um, the BLAST, uh, which is a short name for the internal target program at MIT base. In the end, we use a laser-driven target, just like Hermes uh, target. Uh, uh, let me just say a few words about polarized helium-3. As I mentioned to you that um, for the study of the uh, neutron, we wanted to you know, have effective polarized uh, neutron target, particularly in neutron, because when we use effective uh, nuclear target, whether it's a neutron or helium-3, you always have to worry about the nuclear effect. So ideally, you want to do the experiment with both uh, deuteron and also helium-3. So in the case of helium-3, um, there are two methods. Uh, one can polarize helium-3, and both involving uh, laser, lasers. And one is called metastability change optical pumping. So what does optical pumping mean? Optical pumping means that if I have a, uh, you know, spin, for example, I have a uh, spin uh, one half state, and um, if I, you know, I have two different substates. Let's just take a um, look at here. So if I have a two uh, uh, atomic or electronic substate, and if I, um, you know, give a photon which is circularly polarized, right? Depends on the uh, um, um, helicity of the uh, um, um, photon polarization, whether it's a right-handed or left-handed. And um, I basically can give you know, angular momentum plus one or minus one. And that will drive um, you know, the uh, translation, right? Corresponding to you know, the change of um, the uh, um, 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 spin or, or the, yeah, the spin to be one. And, and that is the way you, you basically, before you turn on the laser, you, know, you have um, particles um, equally distributed in the two magnetic substrate, but when you actually give uh, a polarized light, so that will move um, the uh, um, uh, particle from one substrate to another, right? And then because this is the excited state, so that it will have the corresponding uh, branching ratio based on clefsch gordon coefficient to decay to the two magnetic substrate. But you keep going on as you keep pumping. So eventually, what you are doing is you basically are, you know, moving, um, you know, um, the uh, particle from this substrate to uh, that substrate. So now you have an imbalance of the two uh, uh, ground state um, uh, um, substrate, um, magnetic substrate, so that um, you now have uh, uh, speed uh, uh, aligned. So that is basically the uh, simple explanation for optical pumping. And you use a, a weak magnetic field to define. When I say, you know, along certain direction, you have to define a direction in the laboratory frame and you apply a static uh, uh, weak field to do that. Um, so in the case of helium-3, it's actually a little bit more complicated because you cannot really directly pump from the ground state to the first excited state because you just cannot find a laser that works um, for the corresponding um, energy difference. So you um, do, um, one is to do so-called um, metastability change optical pumping, which means that I use, uh, well, in this case, I use a discharge to excite helium-3 from ground state to its excited state. And then you have this uh, 2S, uh, a triplet S1 state, which is so-called metastable state means it has a lifetime on the order of one microsecond. So that gives you enough time to do optical. Uh, uh, pumping. And you actually, um, um, that again, is the uh, atomic polarization mixed into the nuclear polarization. That's how you polarize helium-3. And the other way is to, uh, use a uh, alkali, whether it's uh, rubidium or um, potassium, you polarize alkali first and then alkali and helium-3 have a dipole-dipole 
um, interaction, and that's how the electronic spin is transferred to the nuclear spin. And, and this kind of technique, both techniques um, have been um, used and well established. And um, more recent time, people use spin exchange optical um, uh, uh, more often uh, when you do a fixed target uh, experiment. Um, but um, more recent time, you know, metastability exchange optical pumping um, has also been proposed by Richard Neumer from the MIT group in collaboration with JLab. And they also wanted to do some inclusive DIS measurement in, with class 12, uh, which is related to uh, for TMD physics. So I want to um, pause here just to see whether there are any questions from the uh, um, audience before I continue. Any questions for Haiwan? Yeah, one from uh, Andrew here. I just had a question about uh, the assumption that the, the, the respective dipole moment or sorry, the polarizations are pointing in the same direction as the respective fields, like the electric field pointing in the direction of the uh, regular dipole, and then the same thing for the magnetic field. Is that just an assumption that can be made if the field is sufficiently oh. balanced to where it then should be straight lines? Uh, are you talking about um, the uh, um, when I talk about uh, in the introduction when I talk about nuclear structure polarizability, or you ask me about? Uh, polarization on uh, experimental technique. Oh, are you talking about electric, electric dipole moment? So which one are you talking about? Sorry, please. All right, uh, more so from the introduction, and I've just been thinking about how that fits into to the actual experiment, but I've, I haven't been able to. Uh, so the, uh, um, the polarizability, it is really, um, it's a definition, right? So it is uh, basically tells you um, when you apply um, e in ENM, right? So that's a definition. So when I apply electric field, for example, right? How the system responds to the electric field. So this is the electric dipole moment and the, um, the coefficient, um, it, you know, is defined as alpha times electric uh, uh, field vector, right? Uh, vector field. And that coefficient tells me the uh, response uh, to the, um, um, external electric field, which is called electric uh, uh, polarizability. And likewise, uh, um, for the magnetic field, we define the magnetic polarizability. And um, when we talk about polarizing um, proton, for example, you have to define a direction. Remember when early on, when I talk about dynamic nuclear polarization, right? If you think about, you know, the uh, Boltzmann distribution, right? And you know, you talk about two magnetic substates, right? And uh, for C one half, so you have to define. It, essentially, it's a mu dot d, right? If you think about magnetic moment, and um, you apply electric field, a magnetic field, and um, you know, correspondingly, the energy shift due to the magnetic field, that interaction is mu dot d and plus or minus mu. Um, you know, if it's one half, you know, we can parallel to the B or anti-parallel. So those are the two substates we're talking about. But I have to define it, right, in, in the laboratory. So the way I define that is to apply a, a, a relatively speaking weak uh, magnetic field. I was mostly confused because I thought for certain materials, like certain types of crystals, that you could get off-diagonal components of the polarizability. And I figured oh. the target was... Yeah, and yeah, I mean, that's actually, I'm talking about the most uh, simplified case and certainly, um, right, so um, in the uh, um, very, you, you can talk about more complicated uh, situation, right, correct, but um, this conversation here is, um, we are talking about, um, you know, the, um, the, the, the dipole um, polarizability. Any other question? Um, there's a chat. Um, oh, leaving a comments on raising hands. You telling people to chat their question. Okay. Uh, so maybe. So yeah. Let me
me just continue on. And very, very briefly, um, I mentioned about EMC early on, but uh, another important result from EMC is so-called proton spin uh, crisis. So when people did um, um, as soon, they used polarized muon beam and polarized target. And when they did the polarized DIS experiment, inclusive measurement means they only detect the scattered electron or muon, sorry, they only detect scattered muon. And um, the result was very surprising. And at that time, you know, the uncertainty, experimental uncertainties were also large. But within uncertainty, they basically saw that, um, you know, their data showed that um, quark spin contributed nothing to the proton speed. And that was a huge surprise. And this is, you know, called proton spin uh, prices. But, you know, that was good in the sense that um, it motivated uh, major, you know, experimental and theoretical activities in the last more than three decades. Um, and uh, essentially, you know, you can see at CERN and SLAC and the Germany, DAISY and Jefferson Lab in terms of uh, inclusive uh, deep elastic scattering with uh, electron beam, muon and electron beam and positron. Um, and, um, and, and later we will talk about some inclusive um, Hermes and the compass and also um, SMC uh, or early on also had some uh, CDS uh, measurement, but not for transverse polarized target. Okay, and um, and um, Jefferson Lab, we will talk about that, but also polarized uh, PP collision at uh, RIC, um, both from Star and Phoenix, and Phoenix uh, completed data taking in 2016. So right now the only detector which is not running is far and in fact we are running <laughs> as we speak uh, we are running with our uh, transversely polarized uh, proton at 510 GeV uh, for proton proton pair and also at Fermilab um, there is a plan to do polarized uh, JR measurement and um, also um, uh, E plus E minus collider on um, both in uh, Japan and Slack and also uh, in Beijing and um, you know, all related to spin physics. So just to um, make the long story short, you know, um, after, um, remember, I mentioned the original EMC showed with the large experimental uncertainty, the quark spin contribute almost like nothing, but after, you know, three decades of study, so now we have a much better picture. And this just show you um, uh, one recent, uh, not the most recent one, but very recent, Global analysis show you that the quark spin, when I talk about quark spin, that includes quark and also antiquark. So that contribution, if you think about proton spin, is one. And that thing, you know, depends on how you look at the uncertainty, but you know, contribution, you know, is on the order of a quarter to a third. So our knowledge about that is much more uh, precise now um, after you know the experimental work. And a very important contribution from um, Rick, um, in terms of spin physics, is really about the gluon spin contribution to the uh, proton spin. And gluon is spin one uh, particle, and proton is spin one half, quark is spin one half. And um, the original um, you know, spin uh, crisis picture was motivated by a very naive kind of belief, which is a simple minded quark model, right? So you, know, you don't even have to worry about gluon, just quark. So that's why people saw that um, the uh, proton spin one half should mostly come from the uh, quark. But once you think about, you know, from QCD and, and the proton or nucleon structure uh, is much more complicated than just quark, right? So they're gluon. So um, Polarized uh, PP scanning experiment at uh, RIC uh, was the uh, first uh, very um, con convincing um, experiment which provide um, the kind of evidence for gluon spin contribution to the proton spin, which is not um, negligible. So this was the result published on um, 2014, 2015. And um, this measurement um, uh, continue on and here show you the more uh, recent um, results published um, last year. And um, from uh, uh, Rick uh, proton spin, and, and the result um, um, 
you know, the overall experimental uncertainty has been improved, but overall is consistent with the previous result in terms of gluon contribution. And of course, um, you know, if you look at the data, right, you, you would agree, you know, we have a lot more work to do um, um, to improve. And that is uh, why, you know, EIC is uh, very important. And later I have slides to show the EIC impact on the gluon of spin contribution to the uh, proton spin. And major progress has been made on the, on the lattice. And, okay, so, um, so now you have a quark contribution. We have much better handle now, right, from the experimental side. And that will also be improved um, with the uh, uh, future EIC measurement and the gluon will be improved in a major way. And then um, and the other question is, what about orbital uh, angular uh, momentum contribution of the uh, gluon and the quark? And uh, on the head of uh, experimental uh, activities or effort. So here show you the lattice um, um, result in terms of you know looking at um, the uh, the 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 op, uh, the uh, look. they look at the orbital um, angular momentum contribution of the uh, quark, and they also look at um, the total. Um, uh, angular momentum, which has the uh, holistic contribution of the quark spin and also the orbital uh, angular momentum of the quark. And then they also calculate um, the, the gluon um, angular momentum contribution. Um, are you guys still there? Did I lose yeah, I the connection? Oh, okay, okay. You know, I taught. I taught one year and Tom taught longer than I did on Zoom. And when this happened, it always made me wonder a little bit, am I talking to myself or not? <laughs> Sorry, and um, okay, good, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, okay, so, um, right. So the very, you know, it, very important is, you know, making sure, right, do you add everything together? Do you get a proton spin one half? And, um, you know, luckily, right, everything looks, um, you know, very, very good, right? Otherwise, we have a major issue. Um, but of course, the lattice calculation has its own um, systematics, and the people are, you know, I'm sure will be improved further. Um, but I think this is actually a very, very exciting um, uh, development uh, results and certainly from the experimental side, uh, we need to catch up. Okay, so this is a picture um, really uh, just put everything together in terms of where the proton spin one half is coming from. And we talk about the quark helicity contribution, quark spin, and we talk about the uh, gluon spin. And um, in fact, I need to update here, which is already improved, but we need to improve that further. And nevertheless, the whole, the picture is clear. Um, you know, we need to also um, um, have a quantitative um, uh, determination or understanding from the experimental side, um, as well as theoretically uh, to see the orbital angular momentum uh, contribution. And I already mentioned about the lattice um, results. Okay, so um, here's just a pretty picture um, and, um, so um, experimentally and uh, theoretically, so we wanted to, uh, one way to uh, think about um, the orbital motion is certainly the kind of um, inclusive measurement um, is not able to give us you know, additional information we are interested in related to um, you know, the orbital motion, orbital angular momentum. So you really want to go beyond the kind of one dimensional picture we have been talking about to go to three dimensions. And, and I'm sure you already have been introduced. Uh, one can look at um, generalized pattern distribution. One can also look at uh, a transverse momentum dependent uh, pattern distribution. So in the case of ge uh, generalized pattern distribution, you are looking at one plus two dimension. One is longitudinal momentum dimension and the other two uh, dimension is transverse but in the coordinate space and um, and TMD you know is in the three dimensional uh, momentum uh, space and here just some nice picture based on um, uh, model of phenomenology to show you 
how you can imagine, you know, what does this mean, right? In the case of, you know, up quark, um, um, unpolarized case and polarized case in the, uh, the two transverse momentum space uh, distribution. And similarly, you can look at um, the TND, sorry, GPD, uh, which is in the coordinate or impact parameter space uh, in the case of unpolarized and polarized. Okay, so this picture is the same thing, and just um, um, I'm sure you already have heard or learned that uh, one way, uh, an important way to unify these two pictures is through the so called five dimensional uh, Wigner distribution. Again, um, this is the uh, transverse momentum, this is the uh, uh, two dimensional um, um, uh, coordinate in the transverse uh, space, uh, um, and this is the longitudinal uh, moment. Okay, um, so I want to maybe, yeah, just spend um, 30 seconds um, just to make everything um, complete, I guess, um, very quickly, just say a few words experimentally, how do you access generalized pattern distribution? Okay, so TND, I'm sure you, you appreciate already uh, is very difficult and TND is also maybe even more challenging um, um, to experimentally um, to do experiment and but nevertheless, a lot of progress has been made. And so when you think about TND, the kind of process um, people are studying are exclusive process, you know, deeply virtual content scattering. And um, um, you know, deep play means if you think about what I talked to you earlier about deep elastic scaling, you want to be in the kind of DIS region essentially. When when you think about the picture I showed, right? You want to be in those kind of you know platonic uh, uh, region, but at the same time, your final state is a virtual photon, which um, well, what you really detect is a laptop pair in the end. So. Um, virtual means this photon is virtual. And one can also do so-called uh, deeply virtual uh, meson production. So the final state, you have a, a meson. And by the way, sorry, uh, I point to the wrong place and because 7 p.m. for me. Um, so this is the deeply virtual, uh, sorry, I apologize. Um, I was pointing, I will come back to this process. I got myself confused. So deep play virtual content is you have a virtual photon here, but you have a real photon in the final state. And this is called uh, deep play virtual content scary. And what I was pointing here is actually double deep play virtual content scary. So this is one virtual photon, and this is the second virtual photon. And the final state is a lepton pair, uh, electron polytron or muon or uh, plus mean minus. And um, this kind of experiment is very difficult, um, you know, for a small cross section and also um, the kind of QED background, such as uh, beta high to the uh, process. Um, nevertheless, progress has been made, and um, I will just skip uh, in the interest of time. But I just want to make one um, um, comment, which is uh, important and. Um, if you guys are interested, I'm sure you, you're not, uh, you are resourceful to find uh, review papers you can read. But one important point I want to make, um, you know, in the case of GPD, is the uh, very well known so called G sum rule, uh, which basically um, connects uh, the integral of these two GPD functions to the uh, um, uh, total um, angular momentum of the uh, quark. Um, to the proton uh, spin. And so, you know, that's one way you can think about if I do a uh, polarized DIS experiment, um, I measure delta sigma, which is the uh, quark uh, spin contribution that will allow me to experimentally to determine the orbital uh, angular momentum contribution. And this is called G sum rule. And so you can see um, they are Hermes experiment and also GLAP and certainly with um, 12 GV GLAP experiment and also EIC, uh, a very important program, it's also generalized pattern distribution. But there, uh, with the uh, um, EIC kinematics, you can actually do GPD on the GUA, which is a very important highlight of uh, EIC science. 
Okay, um, so now let's uh, talk about TMD. So I'm sure you have already been uh, introduced um, to TMD. You already have seen all this, right? So I don't really need to spend time. Can someone say something about this? Yes, no? I don't think so. Go on. Uh, yes? Oh, did somebody? Uh, I don't think we've seen no, this slide yet. We have not seen this slide yet. Oh, okay. So um, I apologize because I, I, I was not able to really uh, look at what has been covered. So if this has not been covered, I'm happy just to uh, um, go over this. And this is always fun in the sense that it's always confusing. And especially your um, lecture is 7 p.m. for her. <laughs> Okay, so uh, making sure I'm still awake. Um, okay, so what are we looking at? Um, so leading twist. Um, so now when you go beyond one dimension, um, which is the uh, longitudinal, uh, you know, uh, momentum direction. We, now we want to include the two uh, transverse uh, 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 quark momentum or uh, uh, part of momentum, and let me just use quark and you can do the same thing for guan if you like and um so if i define the longitudinal direction as the z direction so now i'm also you know interested in you know the x and y for the uh, uh, momentum which is if i use k so it's ks ky okay so now uh, i'm thinking about you know this three-dimensional uh, 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 pdf right we call it tmd pdf or just tmd for simplicity and um, so once we actually include a two-dimensional uh, transverse momentum, so then actually we have eight uh, leading twist uh, TMDs. And um, so what I wanted to show you is these eight TMDs try to use a graphic way so that you can think about in your head or imagine what we are talking about. And so we use this, um, uh, what do we use? We use the black arrow to indicate when, whether the nucleon is polarized or not, okay? And, um, and we use the horizontal arrow to show it is uh, longitudinal or along the Z direction, and we use the other to show it's uh, transverse. And we use the red arrow um, to show is the quark spin, whether it's polarized or not, if polarized in what direction. And if we don't have any error, which means nothing is polarized. So for example, this one is just, you know, we are looking at unpolarized nucleon, and we also look at spin average or unpolarized quark distribution um, inside the nucleon. And that is the, you know, well-known unpolarized um, structure function F1. And um, so if we look at, um, so, so this particular case means that, um, you know, this, the, the target, the proton spin is polarized along the longitudinal direction, but we are also interested in quark spin also polarized in the longitudinal direction. And this is so-called G1. And before we also mentioned G1, but there we were only looking at one dimension G1x. And here we are thinking about G1 in addition to longitudinal momentum, you also have the transverse moment, okay? And um, so a, a few, um, so this quantity is interesting called transversity. So in this case, in the uh, parton picture, now you are having a proton which is polarized in the transverse direction. And then you ask the question, what about the quark uh, polarization also in the transverse direction? You are interested in you know, how that is, uh, the polarization difference in the transverse uh, direction when the target is transversely polarized. And this is called transversity distribution. And if rotation and boost uh, commute, and so this picture and this picture should be the same, right? So if I know G1, I should know H1, but you also know quark inside nuclear is not in a, it is a relativistic system, right? So, you know, um, you have to worry about um, relativity. So therefore they are not the same. And, and one way to uh, measure this quantity, which is interesting is also to allow you to have, you know, a direct, um, 
quantitative understanding um, to see the relativistic effect of the uh, partons inside the nuclei. So, and, and by the way, if I integrate, um, so now, you know, all my um, TND have a K uh, uh, per or KS, KY distribution uh, dependence. But I can integrate over, if I call this two dimension as K per, I can integrate over K per. If I do that, um, you know, um, the only three, the three quantity which actually survive after integration are these three, F1, G1, and H1. And, and this quantity called Sievers um, distribution or Sievers function, sometimes we call Sievers function, is also interesting because um, if you look at the uh, errors, right? So what that what, what tells me, it tells me I am comparing uh, the proton when the proton is transversely polarized in one way and then oppositely polarized in the other way, but I'm actually looking for unpolarized quark in, uh, in this kind of case. And, and that actually um, is um, intuitively, that tells you um, Siva's function will tell you something about um, orbital angular momentum, right? Just very naive picture if you think about, you know, um, angular momentum should be conserved so that, um, so that is the way to help you to think about this, um, you know, in a very simple-minded, intuitive picture. And, and the ball motor uh, uh, function uh, tells you, um, or, or TMD, um, it is um, it's actually an unpolarized nucleon. Now you look for translucently polarized um, quark. So, so all these TMDs are very, very interesting, okay? And um, so what we are interested in is really um, experimentally um, how to um, uh, look for them. And, and one thing I did not mention is um, this quantity called Pritzelocity. And I highlight, I picked three. I mean, it doesn't, it, it, you know, all these are very interesting. And in the end, we want to experimentally um, get a good handle of, of all eight of them, right? But I just pick these three um, as example um, because they are interesting and also because the kind of experiment I will talk to you about will allow me to handle uh, these three uh, at the same time. Okay, so that's why I pick out uh, these three. And transversity, um, if you integrate, if you measure transversity distribution, and in the end, if you integrate over um, the uh, X blogging, and it also gives us a very interesting quantity called um, tensor charge. And um, tensor charge is, um, 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 is actually connected um, to, um, um, neutral, uh, sorry, to electric dipole moment of the uh, proton and the neutron and also uh, related to or uh, connected to um, um, the uh, nucleon beta decay. So um, this uh, tensor charge or transversity distribution or transversity is very interesting in the sense it connects, um, um, it, it's an important quantity in QCD because um, I will show you later so lattice QCD can give us, or already has given us very precise prediction of tensor charge. So therefore, when you do this experiment and you determine tensor charge and you can directly test or compare with lattice prediction. But at the same time, it also allow us to compare uh, with, um, um, you know, I, I will also show you, it also has the kind of new physics uh, sensitivity. Um, or I should say, provide you uh, additional or different kind of tests of standard model, and which makes it very interesting. And crystallosity is uh, something, you know, very, uh, looks like a little bit similar to transversity, but uh, in fact, um, if you think about in terms of um, interesting quantities like uh, spin, of the quark and spin of the nucleon, and you are really uh, probing this uh, dot product. And in the case of crystallosity, you're probing, you know, um, K per is the transverse momentum of the uh, quark. You are probing S, which is the uh, transverse polarization factor of the uh, nucleon and dot K per, and the uh, quark uh, transverse momentum dot K per. 
And um, so this quantity also, it, what is interesting is in different model uh, calculations, uh, they all show that this velocity um, 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 give us information uh, about uh, orbital angular momentum uh, contribution um, of the clock to the photon spin. Okay, so experimentally, how do we um, probe TND? As I already mentioned, some inclusive DIS uh, measurement is uh, very um, effective, and this has been uh, pioneered um, by uh, Compass, by Hermes, and where is Hermes? Uh, did I? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I don't know why. Um, I see some issue, right? Compass, we didn't show. Um, here we show Daisy, but here we didn't show CERN. So that's how it got me confused. Um, so Hermes experiment at Daisy and Compass experiment at CERN are really pioneered. And later Jefferson Lab did a lot of uh, experiment and future EIC. And, and this is uh, what we will be focusing on, see this. And um, I also mentioned about JM and Polar's uh, PP uh, experiment at um, uh, BNL and also Fermilab and um, JPOC and GSI um, definitely um, also are interested in um, this kind of experiment. And early on, we already mentioned about um, E plus E minus uh, uh, annihilation or colliding colliders, which uh, also provide important uh, physics related to TFD. And um, and very important um, aspect um, is uh, for TND is actually this is a, a quite rigorous uh, prediction from uh, QCD in terms of um, the information one get for uh, and also I think um, for motor function. And um, let me just check, making sure I'm not confused myself, yes. And these two um, actually are related. Remember early, I talked about universality. So here is a, a little bit difference, not quite, but in the sense there is a sign difference. So in fact, um, you know, trying to extract receivers from CDIS and compare with JN to see whether there is a sign change or not. And similarly for the motor function is a very important test of our understanding of TND uh, physics. And QCD, and, and, and I will show you um, their uh, interesting results uh, from Compass on that. And um, okay, so let me just say one word here uh, quickly. And, and um, so early on, when I talk about inclusive measurement, right? So we don't really care what happens to the uh, residual of the uh, target, right? So we only detect scattered electron, whether it's electron or muon, right? All I want to make sure is I am. I design my experiment, I set up my experiment, making sure I am in the deep elastic scattering, right? The virtual photon uh, probe uh, corresponding length scale is significantly smaller than the new pen size, right? I don't care what happened to the proton. All I knew is, you know, it's not, it's not elastic, right? So you, you don't have an elastic recall proton in the final state, but I don't measure it, right? I integrate over the uh, final state, that's called inclusive. But now, actually, what I do is uh, the kind of picture. Um, do I have a picture I can show you? Um, unfortunately, yeah, maybe let me use this picture. So in this case, um, the virtual photon actually couples to a clock inside the nuclear, inside a proton, okay? But you also know a uh, quark, uh, we have not seen free quark yet, right? So you always detect them. They always are uh, hadronized, right? Become a hadron in the end. So in some inclusive DIS experiments, so you know the struck quark, right? And we are talking about so-called current or fragmentation region. So the struck quark actually on its way out, it became uh, uh, hadronized into a hadron. So we call leading hadron. So in this ex in uh, in this case, we detect the scattered lepton and also the leading hadron in coincidence. But we don't worry about the remaining of the uh, um, you know, what happened to uh, the residual, right? It's not it's not exclusive process like um, the the deeply virtual quantum scattering means that you know I have a well defined final state, and that's called exclusive. Here, you know, I measure two particles, and I don't worry about remaining. Okay, and this is called semi inclusive. Um, it's not inclusive, but it's semi inclusive. It's not exclusive. 
And um, so, so, so therefore, um, how does this clock right, become a hadron? So there's so-called fragmentation function, which um, is um, uh, important. And when you do some inclusive uh, DIS experiment, and when you do unpolarized uh, CDS experiment, and there is also a fragmentation function, which in some way is, is just tell you the probability for a quark to become a hadron, uh, uh, right? If it becomes a kaon, you need the kaon fragmentation function. If it's a pion, you need a pion fragmentation function. And this can be you know, determined um, um, by um, E plus E minus um, experiment. And, um, and, and also doing unpolarized DIS experiment when you can also um, um, you know, uh, validate um, um, your fragmentation function. Um, you can do global fit um, together with E plus E minus. And um, so Collins um, tells you now is actually um, the, uh, remember um, transversity, for example, is related to a transversely polarized uh, nuclear, and you look at the clutch uh, transverse polarization. So here are uh, the fragmentation function. Uh, also, uh, you are looking at this quark is transversely polarized, and then uh, in addition, you know, here we are also talking about uh, TMD physics. So there is a, um, a, a transverse momentum uh, uh, related um, as uh, a dependence as well. So, um, so for the measurement, I will mention to you that um, you know we need to know the uh, unpolarized um, fragmentation function and also Collins uh, fragmentation function. And Collins fragmentation function um, has been uh, determined, or I should say, the global fit. Uh, e plus E minus collider um, uh, data, which give you a pi on pair back to back. And um, you actually can look at um, the kind of angular dependence of the cross section. You can do a global fit together with the IS experiment. Uh, you can determine, um, you know, from the global fit, you can determine uh, TMD distribution and also um, 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 the uh, Collins uh, fragmentation function. And um, so if you are interested, um, a couple of years ago, um, uh, my colleague um, Anson Lawson at, um, at Duke, um, together with uh, Harut Avian, um, they organized a workshop at Duke. Um, um, the focus is just on fragmentation function. So the website is here and you can you know, learn more. And I think at some point, yeah, let me just also mention, um, there is a review article here by Anson and Angel Metz on um, uh, fragmentation function. And I forgot to mention another uh, important uh, reference, um, but later you will get the slides so you can see, but I really want to mention about where is it? Um, yeah, wait, I thought I have a, or oh, maybe it will appear later. Um, I have a, there is a nice review article uh, published uh, last year uh, by Anson and uh, Mauro Anzamino and um, et al. And which is a very nice and comprehensive uh, review article. Okay, so I think we essentially already covered um, here. And let me just um, define, I think I will just go over this slide and then I think that's for the day. Okay, so, so now I want to define a few things for you. Um, so this is uh, some inclusive um, scattering. Um, and we talk about lepton scattering here, right? The three momentum KK prime vector for lepton, virtual photon, and but we also have a hadron, right? In the final state, we detect for uh, for see this measurement. So here we use this uh, pH vector to represent the uh, uh, the leading hadron we detect, and um, so the two uh, lepton momentum vector define a plane, and that's called lepton plane which is shown by the gray uh, shade. And then the, um, so the virtual photon, of course, is just a virtual photon momentum is just the difference between the, uh, 
the two lifetime, uh, I mean, it's the same. Uh, um, I know I'm tired. So it's the uh, incident lifetime and scattered lifetime uh, moment interference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very hard for us to read the text on this slide. We don't have a good projector, but I just ordered a new projector. I <laughs> passed by. I'm going to go pick But can up. you see? I, I don't worry about it. Don't worry about the graphics. But can you see this picture? Can you see this picture? Barely, but it, it, it might be a good good slide to show tomorrow uh, if you're all. Oh, OK. I mean, OK. So um, it is already late, and, and I, I think I'm also tired. So I, I will actually um, send you the slides. Um, and I apologize. I just you okay. know haven't paid certain things. So I know the font size was small. So I will just end here. So you will have a better projector tomorrow. OK. I will, yes. Okay, very good. So, yeah, if you just want to wrap up, what well, you have to say. To yeah, me. yeah, I think this is a good place to wrap up. I think so. And and if you have some questions, um, I, I'm here, you know, just to, I, I'm happy to be here for um, a few more minutes just to answer the question. Okay, well, let's uh, thank Ayan for her first lecture. So yeah, we can uh, we can take um, a couple more questions from the room or from Zoom. Anyone anyone here like to ask a question? Anyone on Zoom? Mm. Chat chat or uh, unmute and ask a question if you like. Oh, uh, I. people might be ready for dinner. <laughs> yeah, I think that you guys are ready for dinner and um, you know, for people who are in the same time zone as I am, must be tired also or hungry, really hungry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm actually in a very low energy stage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll let you go for today. Thank you for the great um, first half for the experimental uh, overview and um, thanks for staying uh, on stay working late to give us this lecture and uh, I will email you the slide I will email you the slide after I you know have some food to eat we'll post them as soon as I have them. okay okay you. yeah you see you guys tomorrow bye-bye yeah, and uh, bye-bye see you all tomorrow